We'll let them, let them, let them, uh, let them roll in here. So this should be a great discussion, moderated by uh, Shale again, and we've got three great uh, speakers to provide some perspective on the topic. So make your way back in, and we'll uh, we'll get started in a couple minutes. And I'll let you hand it, take it off. Yep. Um, do you mind making sure they flip the thing? The slides, yeah. Well, and the timer oh. needs to. It's I think a forty-five minute session. Okay, I'll go back there and tell them. Can you um, flip the screen over to the slide? I'm sorry? The, sc the screen, to flip it back over. Yeah, and then um, can you set the timer for 45 minutes? Yep, we're good. Oh, okay, great. Turn me down. Can you, can you silence me? Okay. Ask yeah. and you shall receive is One. all I can say. <laughs> that was, yeah. That was my thought as well. I don't. Yeah. Herman, Herman, he's not. No. James, if James Tong is here, I was just emailing with him. Forty-five, forty. Actually, we're like forty-eight now. So when you get started, um, couple, spread out. All right. Okay. If everybody could take their seats, we're going to go ahead and get started. Let people filter in as we as we go. So, welcome back. I hope everyone had a fantastic coffee break, um, and you're you're back at a good time because this is going to be a really great session. I'm personally extremely excited for it. Um, the topic at hand here is a, a question, which is, uh, to what extent, if any, should utilities, particularly regulated utilities, uh, own distributed energy resources? We had a debate session on a similar topic at our solar summit in April. That was specifically about whether utilities should own and rate base residential solar. This is a slightly broader question which is saying distributed energy resources in general, which includes solar, but also includes a whole variety of other things, uh, to what extent should utilities be the ones who own those things? Uh, it's a big question, right? And it's one that is being discussed in regulatory venues across the US right now. You see a fair amount of activity among utilities who are seeking to own and operate distributed energy resources. You see third parties who are either seeking to facilitate that or seeking to oppose it. And I think as we talk about all the other things that are happening on the grid edge and with regard to distributed energy resources, this is going to be a question that's hanging over most of it, which is who should own this stuff? And so we wanted to have this conversation. We wanted to get a few different perspectives in the room on it um, who can take to some extent opposing views in a friendly manner and lay out the, the possibilities on either side. So I'm really excited for the panel that we have here. Um, quick introductions. Julia Hamm is sitting next to me. Julia is the president and CEO of the Solar Electric Power Association, or SEPA. If you don't know SEPA, SEPA um, sits right in between solar and utilities and sort of always has before that was cool. And so SEPA gets, has most of their members are utilities, I think, and then some of the members are in the solar industry and others. And so they have a unique perspective into uh, both what utilities are thinking with regard to solar and how they should be adapting as a result of it. So we're excited to have Julia here. We have Carmine Tillman, who is the Senior Director of Energy Supply at UNS Energy. UNS Energy is the parent company of Tucson Electric Power. And uh, Carmine has a particularly unique perspective on this because I think he's in charge of TEP's residential solar program, which is one of the first in the country wherein TEP is installing and will own and operate residential solar. 
So uh, he actually has, has been doing this, will be doing this, and, and can make the argument in favor. And then finally, John Wellinghoff, who should need no introduction, but John is a partner at Stoll Reeves, and prior to being at Stoll Reeves, John uh, was the chairman of FERC. So he has obviously a long history of experience on the regulatory side, um, and now on the legal side as well, and has also, since leaving FERC, and actually while you're at FERC as well, um, been quite a thought leader in sort of where the market should head with regard to DERs, and has a lot of opinions on this particular question. So, uh, Julia, I'd like you to get us started here and just give us kind of the broad perspective on uh, the extent to which thus far utilities own DERs across the country and your perspective from having talked to a lot of them about uh, how much are they you know, intending to or planning to do so over the next few years. Yeah, <clears throat> so I took a look this morning. We actually, our team tracks pretty closely what different utilities are doing across the country. We have a pretty extensive database. So I actually went into the database this morning to do a little digging. And, and actually there aren't that many examples today of utilities that either historically or um, currently or even announced as planned uh, have ownership of, of solar in particular but distributed energy resources more broadly. Um, you know, we've been monitoring about 40 different um, utility ownership programs across the country, but I, I think one of the, the clear trends, at least sort of looking at just a snapshot in time right now, is that a significant majority of that actually is around utility community solar programs. So uh, the, the instances where a utility is actually owning rooftop solar assets, um, in the case of TEP and, or Arizona Public Service and, and a small handful of others, so far that's really been the exception and the majority of the activity we've been seeing is in sort of the little bit larger scale systems with a community solar program designed around them. Uh, now, I don't know that that's necessarily an indication definitively of where we're going to go in the future. I think a lot of utilities are talking about and thinking about this issue of uh, owning DER assets. Do they want to? Some utilities want to. Some utilities don't want to. Every utility is not the same. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I think we really need to, and, and utilities are thinking long and hard around what, what are the, where are the places where the utility can provide unique value, and that came up in the panel discussion, the leadership panel discussion this morning, and really looking at, from an ownership perspective, where does it make sense for us as the utility to own versus partner? Uh, one of, I think, the sort of most interesting things uh, in real time right now happening is if you're following what's happening with Georgia Power, obviously, from a solar perspective in particular, Georgia Power has sort of gone from, Georgia as a state has gone from zero to 60 pretty much overnight, just in a matter, matter of a couple of years. A lot of it's utility scale, but they also are uh, really moving ahead in full force with the distributed energy resources as well. And uh, there is legislation that was passed in Georgia that Georgia Power worked together with the local industry to, uh, come, to come up with legislation that everybody could agree with that does actually by, by law now allow Georgia Power as a regulated utility to own solar rooftop assets. But um, they are, and they're planning to roll out a customer, off, a, a customer program on July 1st. So we're very, very close to that date. They still haven't announced the program details yet, but I can tell you, and they have said publicly, that at this point in time, they're choosing not to own. They actually are planning to go, what we heard the panel talk this morning about, hmm. up this channel partnership route, or white labeling route, where they are planning, uh, again, sort of not formally announce the details yet, but um, what they've talked about is in, their intentions have been to partner with a, a rooftop solar company, and that Georgia Power wants to be able to offer that product to their customers, but at this point in time, they're choosing not to own it. So different utilities have very different perspectives on whether or not they want to own, in particular, rooftop solar assets. I think that equation changes when we start talking about storage and, and other, other DER. Uh, but, it, but in terms of sort of setting the stage, I think that's probably a good place to start. 
Yeah, and I want to come back to that Georgia Power program as well because I think that's sort of an interesting, it'll be also an interesting contrast to, to TEP's program. I will say also, I, I, I've been surprised by how little of that we've seen over the years as well. I remember I started at uh, GTM in early 2009 and the first report that I wrote for GTM was about, it was like the U.S. solar market in 2009, what was going to happen that year. And it, in 2008, the ITC had been extended six years and also, at that time, that uh, uncapped the residential ITC. It had been capped at $2,000 per home, so that opened up the residential solar market. It also included in that extension uh, enabled utilities to monetize the ITC, which they hadn't been able to do before. So I predicted in that first report that I wrote that there'd be this big wave of utility ownership of residential solar, and I was totally wrong until maybe now, we'll yeah. see. Well, there's a normalization issue, right? And I'm not a tax yeah, expert, and right. you guys could probably talk about that way more, way more detail than I can, but there are some issues that really prevent utilities from aggressively. Right, uh, so that's great transition then. So Carmine, um, DEP has one of the very few programs of its kind in the country. Tell us uh, both what motivated that program in the first place, and then give us sort of the details so that we're all on the same page. Sure, so Tucson Electric, uh, designed and implemented a residential DG program. Uh, really the impetus for the program was in Arizona there is not only an RPS but there is a distributed generation carve out. Um, and it's interesting in how Arizona is one of the few states that particularly define distributed generation. Uh, and it does not use the same definition that say SIA does um, specifically where it's SIA defines distributed generation as being either at or near the load which could be rooftop or uh, but connected to the utilities distribution system. The Arizona definition does specifically stipulate that it needs to be on a customer's premise. Doesn't necessarily define what the premise is, so thinking uh, customer-owned property. Uh, and that energy can be either serving that load on a customer's premise, or it can be grid-tied to serve uh, multiple loads on a contiguous distribution system. So a slightly, a slightly different variation in the definition of distributed generation. With that in mind, our distributed generation carve-out um, is split equally between residential and non-residential. And there's some restrictions on utility ownership on a non-residential side, but there is no restriction on a residential side. So in the context of uh, residential uh, incentives, which are no longer exist in the state of Arizona, uh, at least on behalf of the regulated utilities, we saw, uh, actually, uh, we continue to see a proliferation of uh, residential DG, but it made sense for us in order to hit the long-term targets, uh, uncertainty around future federal action, ITC, how all this pans out, uh, but in addition, offering an alternative option to the consumer. So we're not offering a cash purchase, we're not offering a lease model. So as a regulated utility, vertically integrated, uh, we decided we could offer a specific tariff uh, to a customer and offer them a completely different alternative to simply offsetting kilowatt hour sales. So the design of the program was to effectively we will own and operate, place a residential solar system on a customer's premise, typically on a rooftop, does not necessarily have to be, uh, tied to our side of the meter, uh, there's a number of reasons for that, and then offering the customer the equivalent of a fixed energy rate contract for life of the system or 25 years, uh, roughly equivalent to about the energy that they pay today. So if your average electric bill is about $100, you can expect that that number is going to be about $100 uh, fixed energy rate. We won't guarantee taxes, fees, or surcharges because we don't control the majority of those. Uh, but in general, they don't change very uh, much year over year. So and along with that, you get a basically a 15% bandwidth that as long as your average annual consumption stays within the average annual consumption that we calculated your bill on, that rate will stay fixed, which one protects the utility from excessive use of the system without paying for it. Um, so if you exceed 115% in a calendar year, we'll reset your rate. Likewise, if a consumer chooses to uh, implement energy efficiency measures, um, alter their load uh, characteristics uh, and lower their consumption below 85%, we will lower their rate. Uh, so it's an incentive for the customer to both become an actively engaged energy consumer on an annualized basis as opposed to simply on an hour to hour only trying to mitigate uh, certain pricing signals throughout the summer or uh, you know, the solar production, things along those lines. 
So that's the context of the program? Right. So just to so make sure we're all on the same page. So the, the program is sort of interesting in that they're, they're putting solar on customer rooftops. Uh, the customers don't really see a whole lot to do with that solar. Instead, what they get in exchange for allowing their rooftop to be used for solar is a fixed basically a fixed price for electricity for 25 years, and not in, in cents per kilowatt hour, but in dollars, right? So it's, uh, my bill will be $100 as long as I stay within that bill. Correct, and the reasons for that is that there's been a lot of conversation throughout the industry on benefits of utility with having the utility be able to control and operate, uh, take direct control eventually of the actual inverters of the system, um, facing a system that will provide the most benefit to the grid at certain times of the year, whether or not that's, um, you know, southwest, west facing, and it basically takes the concept of tying the customer's rate of return or benefit from production away and allows the utility to situate the solar facility that best, uh, best helps the grid relative to the customer. So we basically bifurcated uh, production from customer's benefit. Right. So, so John, the argument, I think, in favor of, of this program and, or an argument in favor of programs like it is um, one, they're going to be, you know, presumably west facing, or they're going to be panels that uh, produce in line better with overall load. Um, two, customers get a benefit out of this; they get a, a fixed price for electricity for a long period of time. There's no real harm to those customers. So, what is the case to be made against a program like this? Well, uh, you know, I start from the fundamental premise that everything that is a energy service that can be made competitive, should be made competitive. So things that are already competitive, I don't think we need to make them less competitive by having utilities rate-basing things on the customer side of the meter. I think that's inappropriate. I think it, it, it puts you in a situation that when we start to go to the things that we heard about this morning and that a lot of people have been talking about, that there are these more robust markets at the distribution level, you're going to have you know cross-subsidies and you're going to have uh, situations that, you know, FERC has already uh, pulled apart at the wholesale level. They pulled apart uh, at the wholesale transmission level uh, in the RTOs, the operation of those transmission lines, the markets at that level, and the planning, that's all done by an independent entity, whereas the owner of the transmission lines is only <coughs> allowed to own the lines, invest in the lines, and maintain the lines. And even outside of the organized wholesale markets in, in Arizona and other places, the transmission function at the bulk power level has to be separated from the generators and the marketers. They have to have a wall, a very strong wall. You don't have that at the distribution level, and I think it's, it's necessary to do that if you're going to maintain the integrity of the market and you're going to provide consumers with real choices that are going to be across the spectrum that provide them with competitive choices that actually... Uh, give consumers, you know, the lowest prices. For example, uh, TEP has a community solar program. TEP's community solar program, you pay two cents a kilowatt hour to be in the program in addition. Whereas in Minnesota, they have a community solar program and they pay you to be in it because it's a competitive program. It's a competitive program where ultimately any uh, outside vendor can participate in that program and sign up customers to ultimately be in the program and consumers get paid to be in the program rather than to have to pay to be in the program in a non-competitive program that they have in TEP. So I think you know, that's a great contrast between you know, the power of a competitive program versus the, you know, the results of a non-competitive program. Right. So to encapsulate your position here, it's basically if it can be competitive and this can be competitive, make it competitive. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Carmine, what's your view on, on the sort of the idea that uh, it, the program isn't a great fit or just that you shouldn't be doing that because there is a an vibrant competitive market that could take its place? This is all qualified. Um, contrary to John's position, um, I do not believe uh, that every energy market is a free and open market, nor is any ISO a free and open market when it has an underlying substructure from a utility always ensuring that particular service is there. So there really is no free market, and we're not a free market. We're not an open competitive market. We're a vertically, inter vertically integrated, regulated utility. Um, we have a regulatory compact. There is distributed generation, but as John left out of his kind of explanation there, there's no valuation there for utilizing a grid. And there is no free grid service. And we can have this conversation all day long, but in the context of historical cost of service rate base, 
There is no value of solar any more than there's a value of grid. It's just simply the cost of what it is to use the grid. And if you get to use that grid for free, it's far easier to say that your product is competitive when you don't have to pay for that service. Well, now, but so that, to me, that gets into a conversation around rate structures and around net energy Absolutely. metering. So would you, in a world where rate structures were changed in TP territory mm -hmm. and uh, customers, you know, by your definition, pay the, they pay some fixed fee or something like that that is like a, their fair share of mm -hmm. the cost to serve, then would you still think there's a role for TEP in owning those assets? Absolutely, because at that point, if everyone's paying the same rate to utilize the system, then it's really who's financing the system. And does it really matter if it's the banks behind a third party competitive or if it's the utility? Debt equity issues aside, cost of service, that all plays into um, you know, how we treat uh, or amortize the cost of the model, uh, whether or not you do that over a life of 30 years. Um, and a number of studies have been done. The cost of the service on a short term may be competitive in the short term, but if you look at the entire life of a, uh, a utility owned asset, uh, versus the entire life cycle of a third party, uh, at the end of life, um, it basically comes out to be a wash. So in that instance, it then becomes, if in fact we had a truly competitive market, who wants to sell the product cheaper? But we're not there. I want to go back to, to what John said in terms of the community solar. And I think we all acknowledge we need to, we, you know, we need as an industry, collective energy industry, not the utility industry versus the DER industry, but collectively, to get to a point where we really have a better grasp on the, the costs and benefits. Because, you know, going back to the community solar example of TEP versus sort of the statewide legislated program in Minnesota, you know, I, I would argue, you know, I'm not an expert in the Minnesota program, but I, I'm not sure there are enough, um, that, that enough's been done to really understand what the potential costs are to the overall system based on that design of a community solar program, right? So those community solar projects, the community gardens, are going in wherever people want to put them, which may not be the best place on the grid to put them. And so, you know, you can talk about, okay, what, well, what's the price customers are either paying to participate or being paid, paying to participate or being paid to participate in the program. Uh, but what are, what are the overall system costs in the long run from those different program designs? And I don't know that it matters, honestly, whether it's a utility-owned or not utility-owned asset, uh, but it's really more a, around getting a grasp on those, those costs and the benefits to, to the individual customer, but also to the system. Right. So, so John, if the, the one argument for utility ownership of these assets is uh, utilities are best positioned to place the right assets in the right places, where it's most efficient for the grid and thus pro provides the most reliability and the most affordable electricity for everyone. Um, what's the counter argument to that? Why should the third well, party? It, it comes down to cost and benefits, just like Julia said, and that's exactly what California is doing right now. They're doing a distribution resource plan to find the cost and benefits of location of distributed resources within that grid. Once you reveal that, then open it up to the market. Allow the market then to compete on those values and compensate the market for those values. In other words, if I put in a west-facing solar panel in a place where there's a tremendous amount of congestion, I should get recognized for more benefit for that system than if I put in one that's south-facing that's not in a congested area. And these are values that can be revealed, that are going to be revealed in California. I'm sure they're going to be doing the same thing in New York. And it's where we need to move to. It's where we need to move to and as long as we're stuck in a, in a non-competitive situation where we're, we don't have those values revealed and we don't allow the revealing of those values to be compensated adequately in a competitive market, then we're never going to optimize the system. We're never going to truly lower costs for consumers. And I would agree. You know, it's really about <clears throat> trans, you know, transparency and utility ownership is not the only way to capture some of those values. You can, there are things that you can do, right? But but the big question today is we're not there yet. <laughs> and you know, so utility ownership in, in today's world may be a reasonable option, but that may change over time as we have transition paths to some other future. Uh, but, but I agree, we need more transparency. Um, yeah. So let, let me talk about where utility ownership may be appropriate. A smart utility that's done something with a distributed resource that I think makes sense for them 
to rate base it. It's not on the customer side of the meter. It's actually on the utility side of the meter, but it is facing in a way that it provides both distributed resource value to the distribution system and value to the customer. A Vista Utilities, they just put in the largest flow battery in North America and Europe in the Turner substation in Pullman, Washington. That particular facility helps them uh, defer investments in that substation, provides them with support with respect to that substation, but yet it's an adjacent to a customer, Schindler Engineering, it allows them to give them Black Start, give them UPS, and give them other services to that customer. So it's a dual purpose. It's rate-based by the utility, but it makes sense as a utility investment for distributed resources. And that's a, that's a one megawatt, four megawatt hour yep. storage facility. Yep. So what distinguishes that from everything else that we're talking about? What makes that okay in your mind where what TEP is doing or even some other program doesn't? It's provo primarily providing utility distribution resources uh, or, or value to that distribution utilities distribution system. It is on the uh, utility side of the meter and ultimately it's something that's probably not going to be competitive from a standpoint of you know placing something at a substation. It's something that a utility ultimately is going to you know invest in putting in their uh, particular facility. Now an another example I could give you where you could see both sides of it you could look at Verintech, for example, that has a voltage control system that would go on the utility side of the distribution system on their poles versus somebody who has a smarter inverter that could put it on the uh, customer side on the, um, uh, the solar system on a house or a commercial facility that also could provide voltage control. So who should get to own it? Who should get to rate base it? Well, I'd say if it went on the utility side, went on the poles and was providing voltage control that, you know, Tucson should be able to rate base it, but if it's a smart inverter on a utility com or on a, uh, a customer-owned competitive system that's you know going to the customer, uh, commercial or residential customer, and providing that voltage support, and they should get paid for it, uh, it should you know be owned by the customer or or supply competitively. I, I wonder. Let me just uh, jump to Carmine for one second. I I wonder. You know, one of the things we've talked about in some of these discussions before, and you're mentioning sort of where there can be a competitive market, there should be. There are definitely market gaps right now, right? There, there are customers who theoretically could have solar on their rooftop who don't because the solar market's not structured to enable that. Either they're low FICO scores, so they can't get it financed, or they're renters, so they can't get the system installed. The, you have a renter tenant issue. You've got, you know, the, the rooftop that is sort of west facing and solar installers won't won't deal with it because they want south facing right now. So I guess Carmine, uh, with the program that you're running, to what extent are you thinking about or focusing on those customers where there's a, a current market gap? Is that part of the plan? Uh, so I'll address that and then I'm going to move into another program which is coming out next week. Am I? Is that on? Yeah. There we go. Um, so yes, it is open to all customers. Uh, we do have some targeted areas specifically uh, looking at uh, certain distribution feeders where we may be able to garner some additional system benefits by increased penetration. Uh, but that's somewhat of a double-edged sword. And if there's any power flow or system engineers out there, uh, when you operate in a service territory that has dramatically different load profiles from winter to summer to spring, you find that when you solve one problem on loading in the summer, you can often create an additional problem in the, the spring or the light load periods of the fall uh, with voltage instability. So those are multiple issues that we have to address. And to John's point, everything we do is on our side of the meter. So whether or not it's on the customer's rooftop, their front lawn, or uh, an, an empty lot that a customer owns is irrelevant. It, the location is irrelevant. The location we chose to offer this particular tariff to the customer is predicated on the Arizona definition and not necessarily definition of distributed generation. We do not restrict our customers based on FICO scores or any of those other things because as a regulated public service corporation with a regulatory compact to serve all customers, we're accustomed to taking that risk. Uh, we're accustomed, and actually we have a very, very low um, bad debt ratio as a utility. The one thing we find is that while people may skip a house payment, they may skip a car payment, in general, they will make their electricity payment because of all the things they can live without in the middle of summer, electricity is not one of them. So, and we do work with our customers. We have low income assistance programs. Um, so it's open to all customer base if they choose to be on this particular tariff for this rate and it actually allows them to adjust their energy patterns and become a better actual energy consumer in our eyes. The new program that will be released next week um, as part of our filing takes this particular concept and to community solar, um, 
places like Minnesota that assign at a value of solar, it's just subsidies somewhere else. Someone else is picking up the cost of that service. The original community solar at TP was designed in order. Um, the fact is the, the, the initial cost of the solar is more expensive than uh, traditional cost of service. So they pitch in additional two cents. They don't have, if you want to call it a headache or the hassle of ownership, but they can support solar. Um, obviously, all you got to do is look at the annual rest plan to ex you know, we're about 40 to $50 million annually to support all these programs and facilities, the additional PPA cost above market. So they're kicking in extra to support solar development in the region. Not unlike a lot of green power programs throughout the nation, this one's different. But by taking the community solar program and redefining really the definition of distributed generation to be in a larger, more cost-effective system tied to the feeder or grid in my low voltage distribution circuit while still offering a customer an alternative tariff is it going to be the next program that we roll out. And again, this is all down to consumer option, uh, working within the construct of the Arizona RPS, uh, which is obviously different from our state to state, um, territory to territory. Um, you know, in a free market, we're not a free market. We're a regulated public service court, uh, to, you know, uh, entity with an obligation to serve all customers. Uh, net metering policies aside, they're just policies. Rate design issues, they're just rate design issues that get resolved going forward. We're talking about what's the most cost-effective solution for the implementation of solar. And there's another, <clears throat> actually another Arizona-based good example to your question. Um, APS has a program that they've actually had since 2010 focused on uh, schools and government buildings. And they specifically focus on schools that are economically challenged, is, is the wording that's used, but they're, they're, they're schools that would not otherwise be able to have solar. So, you know, that's been a very successful program. I think APS is actually in the process of trying to uh, expand that even further. Uh, but it's a great example of, of a utility, uh, a utility owning those DER assets um, in a market that today the solar industry is just not going to serve. So. Right. So, John, let me ask you a two-part question then. Um, sure. The first part is, I guess I'm curious your opinion on this. You know, is there is there a role for utility ownership in the case where there is at least for the time being a, a market gap? There's some portion of the populace that that can't install solar where they otherwise could. And then second, sort of moving on from that, I guess we've been focusing mostly on solar because this is where most of the conversations have been occurring. You mentioned a storage system. I guess I'm curious in general, um, the topic of this panel is utility ownership of DERs in general. Do you view any distinction amongst different types of DERs and the grid services that they can provide with regard to whether that means a utility should be able to own them? No, I don't. I, I mean, again, I think it's an issue of whether or not the service can be competitive or not. And I think, you know, there's some difference here, obviously, as to my view of what the value of these distributed resources are. I mean, I don't believe there's a subsidy in Minnesota. I think they did a very good job of looking at what that value of solar was. They determined what it was, and they've got a community program that's, you know, competitively bid out that ultimately is very successful, going to be very successful for uh, the consumers in Minnesota, and, and then serves all that unserved market. The TEP program doesn't go to renters, it only goes to homeowners. So, you know, ultimately you've, you still have a huge unserved market there out there with solar. And I think that market can be provided uh, services with a competitive program, uh, you know, similar to the Minnesota one. And again, we do need to look at the value of distributed resources. I think a number of studies have shown uh, in Nevada, uh, New Mexico, uh, Louisiana, and a number of other states <clears throat> that ultimately the value of solar uh, may in fact be higher than the retail rate. And, and of course, that's what they found in Minnesota as well. Uh, and you know, these were very carefully uh, done studies that uh, w were done by some very, uh, very uh, good analysts. And ultimately, I think they support the fact that you know, if you look at what the real values are from, for these distributed resources, they can be put in on a competitive basis and they can be provided to a whole array of customers across the, uh, the spectrum. I think there's, you know, one thing I've been thinking about a little bit um, with that regard, we could have days of conversation around the value of solar and, you know, get back and forth on that. There was a, a study that, it's a working paper that just came out from Berkeley um, from the Haas School of Business that uh, did one of these sort of model simulations of PG&E's uh, system and looked at the value and cost that various penetrations of PV would provide. 
And they found a slight net benefit overall. Some studies find the benefit, some studies find a cost. But what I thought was interesting was they found a slight net benefit overall through uh, TND and capacity deferral and stuff. Uh, but in nine, on 90% of feeders, there was no value. And then on 10% of feeders, there was a lot of value. And I think one thing that's interesting is a lot of us talk about uh, making that all transparent and creating mechanisms to incentivize third parties in particular to go put solar and other assets where it's most valuable. And I wonder whether we're not thinking about a side effect to that, which is that, well, it's going to be very valuable in a small number of places, and there will be a lot of places where it's actually not that valuable. Do we want to take the market away from those customers? I guess, Julie, I'll get your opinion on that first. No, I, I don't know that I have anything. I mean, I think that's a, a great point. Um, John, yeah. I mean, well, is that a concern? I, it doesn't take the market away from anybody. It simply appropriately values those resources where they're placed. And I, I have no problem with that. And again, that's what the exercise is happening uh, in California right now that we're going to get you know, some data on that in July 1st very soon here as to uh, distributed resource planning uh, to ultimately determine what these values are. But you know, it'll be, some will be more valuable than others. All of them will be valuable, and certainly they're valuable to the customers who put them on their roof. The other thing we have to remember about rate basing anything on the customer side of the meter is every customer, for every dollar that is invested in that, the customer is going to pay $3 for rate basing it for a utility over 30 years based upon a 95 or 10% cost of, of, of overall capital. Now, that's much more expensive than you know, I can roll up my mortgage for 3% or, you know, all kinds of ways that you can do it for a lot less money. So, you know, that's the other thing that concerns me. I think that the utility rate basing these things is ultimately costing consumers overall in, in the, in the uh, utility rate payers more overall and, and consumers as well. Well, and I think we have to look, yeah, I think that's a good point, right? If you think back to one of the first, you know, big uh, utility-owned programs, it was Southern California Edison, right? And so they were going to own, uh, you know, rooftop, 250 megawatts, 250 of, commercial, megawatts yeah. of commercial scale, you know, commercial rooftop solar. <laughs> uh, ultimately, uh, you know, they ended up scaling back that program multiple times for a couple of reasons. I and mean, a big part of it was they found that the private sector could do it less expensive. And so they backed off and said, yeah, let's let the private sector do it. I think one of the other challenges was the, the decision by the commission was, okay, SCE, you can do this, but then we're also going to authorize the, the solar industry to do an additional amount under PPAs. Right. Um, and it, it, the utility, by, it, it just by the nature of the utility, it takes a long time to get a program like that up and running. So by the time SCE was really r ready to hit the ground running, the private sector had already snatched up most of the good rooftops mm -hmm. where you could do the lowest cost installations which just made that problem uh, you know, even worse on the fact that it would cost the utility more to do it than the private sector. So I, yeah, I think John has a fair point there too, right? You've got to look at um, you know, what's the most economically efficient way to do it. And in some cases it will be the utility and in some cases it won't be the utility. Well, and also it comes down to consumer choice. I mean, consumers could, should have the choice of the type of systems they want. I mean, ultimately uh, the TEP program is, is Single-sourced panels from Norway. I mean, maybe I want to buy American. You know, maybe I, I, I want American but customers panels. Customers still have that choice. Customers aren't forced. No, to I understand. I understand, understand that. But you're, but, but you're saying is these underserved people who don't have a choice otherwise. If this is their only choice, then they're forced to take panels that are sourced from Norway. Ultimately, they don't. They, they don't well, have a choice. It's better to have so, a choice than zero choices, so, right? <laughs> Well, I mean, again, I think you could have a competitive program like the community solar program in Minnesota that serves everybody, not just the homeowners, but also serves the renters or anybody else who wants to get into it and gets, actually gets paid to do it rather than have to, have to pay two cents to do it. And I'll just add on, and again, we can have the conversation of value. Uh, the fact is, John, in the cost of service model, and you're well aware of this as a regulator, right? When you define what that cost of service is, saying there's a forward-looking value discounts the fact that you get to use that for free. It's not free. It doesn't, that value, and, and it, it's almost a Popeye method of, you know, I'd gladly pay you today for a benefit I'm going to get somewhere down the road that's evaluated, and that evaluation, an evaluation of solar discounts the value of what the grid is that supports the backbone of that solar. It is not, you know, the cost of service model is just mathematics. It's simple numbers. You can argue about it all day long. But there's a simple cost to use in the grid. Whatever that cost is, whether it's Minnesota, whether it's TEP, community solar, um, it offers a number of values. Um, it, what I'm hearing in your argument is 
we want consumer option as long as I don't get to provide it. Well, my consumers will determine whether or not they want the program I offer or not. If they don't want it, they don't have to, you know, uh, sign up for it. And my regulatory body, which you're very familiar with, will evaluate it rate case to rate case whether or not it was prudent. And they'll disallow that. And the interveners, such as the industry, who is in every one of our cases, our hearings, they'll make sure that it's either prudent, cost effective, and allow the regulatory body to do their job. To say that they're not or that shouldn't happen, it, it takes away the consumer option. And I don't think that's fair either. So let's let the consumers choose. Let's let them give the option. I'm not taking away from third-party ownership model or, or direct purchase model. If a consumer wants that, it's still available to them. Under the construct of today's rules, it's available. If they want to you know, have a solar system with a different tariff, they can come play in our program. If they want to choose the new program that we're going to propose and hopefully it'll be approved, it's an alternative option for them there. The additional program, uh, you know, our renters, our apartment dwellers, the third party isn't offering them anything, and quite frankly, it's very difficult to offer them a product less than cost of service based on solar when we know we can't do that, and neither can the third party industry. If you could, you would, and they're not. Well, so I want to let John give a quick response to that, but then we're, we're short on time. I do want to leave time for one or two questions, so have those in your mind. Um, John, quick response to that, if you could. Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't deny what Karma is saying about the value of the grid and the issue that, you know, if you're using the grid, you should pay for it. That's a rate design issue, and we've got to get that straight as to what the appropriate fixed costs are. I mean, it's it's an issue, although, you know, even in, in, in your... Um, um, uh, residential uh, solar rooftop program, you specifically say in your 21-page agreement that if the fixed costs change, they're going to have to pay them. And so, you know, uh, if there's a, a change in rate design, ultimately, the, it, if ACC changes the level of fixed costs, and you, and, and we give you're, them an out. Oh, they, oh, they, they get they out. Get out and, of the program. And, and they have to pay an exit fee then nope. when they go out. No. Nope. Well, they have to pay an exit fee if they if they uh, if they sell the house and the, and the new consumer doesn't want to want the system, right? There's an option to get out at that point, yes. But there's they have to pay an exit fee, right? That's what the agreement says, they have to pay an exit fee. Well, but fact, presumably, you, well, I mean, there's... It's like there's, saying there's no penalty for terminating the contract. No, I understand, but it's no different than a lease, is what I'm saying. Right. So you're, right. you know, you're, you're saying, you know, in, in, your, in your materials that, you know, well, it's, you know, giving consumer option different than the lease, but ultimately it comes down to the same as a lease. So, again, you, you should, in fact, be paying the appropriate value for the grid. I have no no qualms about that, but you also should be paying the appropriate benefits to those people who are putting in these systems, and that should be part of the whole competitive market that, you know, goes forward, and that is not happening in, in right. every state. Look out for Green Tech Media's Value of Solar Conference later in 2015. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions from the audience? <laughs> Hands up if you have any. I see one just back over there. There's a mic coming your way. Thanks. Um, we've been in the United States recognizing the monopolies uh, exhibit and use monopolistic power for over 100 years. And the answer for utilities, electric utilities, have been uh, the regulators, the state regulators, in particular on retail matters. Um, to my knowledge, the, the, the burden on the state regulators in the evolving world is quite significant. And to my knowledge, Nobody has really done a true cost of service looking at all DER resources, truly getting down to costs and working all the way through rate design. Rather, we're squabbling about a fixed fee here or a fixed fee there as a Band-Aid. Um, my question is ultimately uh, to the regulators. Are they up to the task? Because we're going to have to move 50 plus uh, sets of regulators, public counsel, uh, and uh, everybody else through the rate design for all of these utilities. And, and really, aren't they outmanned by the utilities who are going to do what they're going to try to do, especially if they're allowed to uh, use that, that position that they have with operating the wires system? Uh, aren't, we, aren't, aren't the DER industry outmanned? It's a great question, John. I'll let you take that first since you're a former, former regulator. regulator here, yeah. yes. Well, I'd say that they're not. I think our state commissions are a pretty intelligent group of folks. And, and I think they do a tremendous job. And you can look at the FERC analogy. FERC 
you know, started out as an economic regulator and then has now moved to a market regulator. And they've, they've, they've in fact, uh, successfully gone through that transition with a few bumps like Enron in 2000, where they had four people in the enforcement office and you saw what happened with Enron, and now we have 200 people. FERC has over 200 people in their enforcement office, and I think they do a fairly decent job of policing the wholesale markets. But again, it's the same kind, kind of transition that the state regulators have to go through. They have to go from an economic regulator to a market regulator, ultimately, to, to open these markets like they're doing in California, like they're doing uh, in New York, like they've done in Texas already. Uh, ultimately, and so you know, I think it can be done, uh, but it just has to be you know uh, you, you, you're going to need different types of people. You're not going to need so many accountants. You're going to need you know more uh, uh, um, enforcement people, more consumer protection people, and people to oversee what's happening in the markets. Can I, actually, can, can I ask John a question? The regular question. Great, you get the last question. Then. All right. <laughs> so, so I'm just curious, and actually, this is a question I've had for you for a while, which is been forgetting to ask. I'm curious from your perspective, in a case where you have a co-op that's member owned, yes. how does your view differ on this this utility ownership issue if it's mm -hmm. an investor in utility versus a co-op? Well, a co-op or a muni is in fact, uh, in the paper I did uh, for, you, for the 51st state, talks about the IDSO, an independent distribution system operator. A co-op or a muni in fact is an independent system, system operator because they don't rate base anything. They ultimately, you know, don't have a, a profit. They only have a cost of debt ultimately that they have to worry about. And so, that, you know, they are operating, you know, totally on behalf of the consumer or their members in the case of a co-op because they're actually member owned and they vote for the, the, um, the people who run the co-op. So th I think that's very different from uh, an investor owned uh, utility that, that rate bases uh, plant and has to do that uh, to serve customers overall. Yeah, and I think that'll be interesting to see, assuming the ITC doesn't get extended in 2017. I mean, one of the reasons that you haven't seen a lot of co-ops and munis trying to do this is that they are nonprofits. They can't, they don't have tax liabilities, so they can't monetize the ITC. Once the ITC, assuming it does, drops to 10%, becomes a smaller portion of the system, I think you could see a lot of co-ops and munis. Yeah, well, and actually, we're starting to see co-ops form um, LLCs, and they're, right. they are now competing in the solar they're, marketplace they're under the LLC They're competing in the solar structure. marketplace, and they're doing a lot of uh, community solar projects. Mm -hmm. Co-ops are very big on the community solar projects, yeah. absolutely. Right. Great, that's all the time that we have. Please join me in thanking our panelists from this session.